perioperative management of uveitis to imaging modalities in uveitis just because um, a resident is supposed to help me with this. And I think it's better for a resident to learn a lot about perioperative management of uveitis than for me to just talk about it. Um, I think that's the point of grand rounds. So um, today I'm going to talk about imaging and I have collected cases from here where I showcasing some of the imaging findings that um, just about you know, what disease a patient might have. So there we go. I have not accomplished any financial disclosures. <laughs> <laughs> so our objectives will be to learn about OCT, fluorescein angiography, endocyanine, green angiography, fundus autofluorescence uh, for the diagnosis of uveitis. And we're not going to get into the weeds because I know that we don't just have retina people here. We're just going to talk about like, what would it help us learn about? Um, and just know when to use each one and understand how these modalities could help us with diagnosis and treatment. So just briefly, like approach to uveitis, we want to know what it is. Okay. And when we want to know what something is, we have to have an anatomic designation. And even if you were preparing somebody for surgery, you have to know what part of the eye is affected. If you don't know what part of the eye is affected, your patient is already in trouble. Like you've done them a disservice. So you need to understand what the extent of the disease is. And often it's imaging that will help me determine this if I think it's necessary to do some imaging. And then the workup <clears throat> of our residents, we talk about that, but we won't go over that today. How bad is it? So... What are negative prognostic indicators, vision loss associated with it? Because that's a big one. We're ophthalmologists. We're here to save vision. <clears throat> um, sometimes it's one millimeter of mercury at a time. Sometimes it's one endothelial cell at a time. Just depends what part of ophthalmology you do. Um, and we want to know if there's any damage to vital structures and negative sequelae from that. And then what are we going to do about it? So how do we treat it? What's the appropriate treatment? So classification, just briefly... We have anterior, intermediate, posterior, and then the other things that are kind of like not in the globe, but still part of the uveitis umbrella. So scleritis, ocular surface disease, PUK, keratitis, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and Sjogren's. If you send me anything in the last category, I'll send it back to you. I won't see it. You don't want to do that. Okay. I think it's a diagram. Just so we remember, like that anterior uveitis, I'm sorry, I'm still recovering from COVID. <clears throat> anterior uveitis is uh, involving the, you know, anterior part of the ciliary body and the iris. And so that's the, pretty much the anterior chamber. Uh, intermediate uveitis is like posterior cyclitis or parasplenitis or, in, you know, intermediate uveitis involved, mostly inflammation is in the vitreous humor, um, but it comes from blood vessels, usually in the anterior <clears throat> part of the fundus. And then, um, Posterior uveitis is choroid and retina, and then pan uveitis is usually a combination of all of those. Okay, briefly, anterior uveitis. So if you have a patient in front of you, part of how you know what kind of uveitis they might have is their symptoms, but also like what you're seeing on exam. And then there's kind of more, which we'll get into with our cases. So all the anterior stuff, redness, pain, ow, right? Photophobia. Um, you'll see injection or redness, keratic precipitates. Some of it's really dramatic, like the first two pictures on the left, and then some of it's less dramatic. Um, posterior synechiae, peripheral anterior synechiae, all these things in the three bottom in the exam, those are all like, they can be potentially be negative prognostic indicators, right? Because they could mean that you're going to have damage to the eye. Intermediate uveitis, symptoms are more insidious, floaters, flashes, blurry vision. Um, exam findings are going to be like vitreous cells, haze, snowballs, periphlebitis. What I will stress in this category is that this is extremely varied and very gray in terms of when does something become an anterior uveitis to when does it become an intermediate uveitis? Is the posterior cyclitis or the posterior ciliary body affected? Um, it can be very subtle. So we wanna look for cells behind the lens and determine, do we need to do any additional imaging? Because this is where <clears throat> I usually find, I get a lot of referrals for anterior uveitis and there's so much more going on. So. Posterior uveitis, some of it's really obvious, like there's clearly stuff here, like, um, you know, yellow spots, and this one has spots. Dot. So blurry vision, blind spots, flashes, findings could be choroidal lesions, retinal lesions, optic nerve swelling, vasculitis, and people always go, you know, not so for posterior uveitis because it's, um, it can have a really blinding effect if it really involves a macular or optic nerve. 
don't go nuts over posterior uveitis and then give them Durazol. That's kind of sad, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to say, oh, I'm really worried about your posterior uveitis. Here's some Durazol. That's bad. So imaging modalities in uveitis. Optical coherence tomography. Well, we're, we're going to talk about these four, okay? There's still OCTA, but it's not like a gold standard, so we're not going to talk about it. OCT, we have regular, well, we have all kinds, and, you know, EDI, enhanced depth imaging. We have FA, fluorescein angiogram, ICG, fundus autofluorescence. Let's just briefly going over each one, um, and then I'm going to harass the residents shortly. Don't worry. Um, OCT. So it's non-invasive. Um, it allows you to localize edema, right? So that's what we love our OCT for. Is it dry or not? Okay, it's dry. We're done. Nothing. No. So we can also localize the affected retinal layer. We can also look at retinal thickness and choroidal thickness. So these retinal thickness and choroidal thickness can really be kind of a poor man's FA if you're stuck and you don't have stuff. But you have to look at these things. You can't just be like, oh, well, it's dry, so they don't have anything. It's fine. Fluorescein angiogram. So we're looking at macular edema, angiographic leakage. So this is where we said we'll localize edema, right? We might have cystoid macular edema. We might have SRF on our OCT, or we might not. We just may notice, hey, this OCT in this right eye is much thicker than the left eye, right? Because I have a good RP. It's pumping out all that fluid. So maybe I have angiographic leakage there. Um, we could find CNVM, disc leakage, late staining of the vessels, neovascularization of retinal vessels. So NVE, NVD, um, capillary dropout or non-perfusion, and pig, uh, retinal pigmented epithelium disruption or loss. <clears throat> ICG shows me if something's at the choroid and it can detect abnormalities in choroidal blood flow. I think it's more complicated than that, but that's how I use it. I mean, I read a lot about it, but it's interesting. Fundus autofluorescence. Um, this allows us to detect pathological changes to the RPE and it can show disease activity in specific types of posterior uveitis. And it's not invasive. It can also be useless if we're not having the right part of the retina affected. Okay, so we don't want to just stop there and say, well, I got a fundus photo and I got an FAF, it's fine. Because we'll look at some. So how can imaging help us? It can localize the disease. For me, it's the big reveal subclinical disease so that I know the extent of what I'm treating and I have the correct endpoints um, to target my therapy. And that's it. So I want to go through some case presentations. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we just care about imaging. So I have a 14-year-old male presents with a history of allergies and pink eye treated with Predforte. And this is not an insidious case. This is like obvious. Okay. So two to three months, she's got symptoms. She went to the optom, she went to the ophthalmologist. And finally she came to like my best buddy, Jody Brown. And he was like, oh my gosh. So he came to her, she came to him and she was like, oh, I'm seeing like the big E on the eye chart. And um, she was on Predforte, right? Cause they treated her with Predforte for three months. And so she didn't have any cell in the AC, but she had 360s an EKA almost. And she had, uh, nothing really in the vitreous in the right eye and then inferior vitreous debris. So this is what she looks like. Um, Taurus. So <laughs> just tell me briefly if you see anything here. Um, yeah, there's a few hypopigmented lesions um, kind of scattered in the, um, kind of the periphery. Yeah. Anything else? The hyperpigmented spot nasal to the disc on the left. This, yeah. Okay, I'll go back over what Para said, but I'll do it the way that, you know, we busted it. Well, we, the way we, but I, I wasn't fair. I asked Paris, I said, is there anything here? And he dove into it like, like, you know, that's what he was asked to do. But uh, so the media is fairly clear. Maybe I could, you know, hallucinate Trace Hayes, I don't know, in the left eye. Um, you know, disc is, to me, it's a tad hyperemic, but it's hard to know because Optos has this weird red green filter. Um, Vessels look okay. I don't really see. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's like a little bit of um, thickening of the the venules, but I'm not quite sure. And then um, macula, the reflex is a little off to me, like the sheen, because this is a young person. She's 14. This is the normal sheen I would expect, and it's kind of like dull here. And then she does have one hypopigmented spot here, one little hypopigmented spot here, one hypo, and this weird. Um, 
little thing, maybe it's a little bit of bear tracking or something. So um, that's that's what I see. I don't see anything crazy here. Um, but this is her OCT, so that's pretty bad. Um, so, Paris, where's her fluid? Um, multiple layers. Yeah. Retinal and also subretinal. Yeah, interretinal and subretinal. So what did I do next? FA. Yeah, I got an FA. Yeah, of course. Because I was like, well, <laughs> she's got these hypopigmented spots, and I'm not going to just call them chorioretinal scars and run away. <laughs> so, okay, so this is her FA. So this is her late uh, FA. Uh, Peter, what do you think? So okay. this, I'm just showing you a single image. It's not fair. Um, but we're in a late phase, and then yeah. it's just super hot, like no, like crazy on both sides, and then there's uh, some leakage right at the macula there. Yeah, what kind of leakage is it? Um, kind of looks like a petaloid pattern. Right, so petaloids in the macula, good. So we have petaloid leakage of the macula. We have really aggressive late staining of the disc. How about the large vessels? They have a lot of leakage on them. Um. I mean, other than off the disc, like I would say the arcades look pretty good other than right here, maybe. Yeah, so I call this small vessel leakage and I think it's, you know, mostly, it, it's more, it's more, it's more in the, um, you know, uh, po peripheral retina, but there is a whole bunch in the posterior pole. I mean, I call this kid pan uveitis just because she had stuff in the AC and lots of synechiae. So I can't say that's like really mild. I couldn't say this is spillovers from somewhere else. So I thought she has anterior uveitis. To be honest, like I think this is a really bad case of intermediate uveitis, like a horrible case, but because it's right, because there's like sort of this lucency here, but because like, you know, it's the whole eye and she has horrible macular edema. I just called her pan uveitis, but I think, you know, some people would roll over in their grave. So what did I do next? Um, okay, so somebody gave her Pred Forte. Should I just give her Durazol? She's 14 years old and she is, I know all the peds ophthalmologists are gonna cry. She's telling me that she can see on her phone. And I was like, how on earth can you see on your phone? She goes, well, I screenshot it and I blow it up and I read it. And I was like, how did your parents? <laughs> like I was, <laughs> so we gave her, what did I do next? I wanna treat her quickly. Steroids. I pulse dose steroids, but it's been going on for three months. She has negative sequelae. She has all this bad stuff. So I, I called the pediatric rheumatologist and I said, can you see her right away? And so we started her on uh, methotrexate and Humira almost at the same time. I was like, this is a two agent kind of gal. She's in trouble. Um, so now she looks almost the same except appreciable differences. So we talked about that sheen, right? So that sheen is back here, right? So like, let's go back here. Kind of dusky gray, no sheen. The sheen is just here. The sheen is back. I mean, you can't diagnose everything off of fundus photos, right? But you had the OCT and the nerve is nicer looking. And I feel like there's more sheen on the vessels. I think overall she's doing better. She still has those hypopigmented spots. And I would say she has sarcoid because of that and also her um, hydroxy D125 was low, which is sometimes an indicator of sarcoid in kids. And this is her OCT. She's doing remarkable. She's 2020 and this is her FA. So it's not perfect. We don't always get perfect FAs, but I bet you if you give her another eight months, it'll, it'll be like nothing ever happened. Case two, this is a 35 year old male who came to see me. He has blurry vision more in his left eye than his right eye. He saw an outside retina specialist, a very smart lady, who diagnosed him with posterior uveitis and sent him to rheumatology. His last flare up was in March, 2020. And he came to visit me that fall and he's 2020 OU. He's like, I'm not flaring, I'm doing good. And his anterior segment exam is hundred percent normal. He has no cells in the vitreous or anything. So these are his pictures. Um, here. So in the right eye over there, um, so media is clear, right? Media looks clear. Nerve looks cupped, but the margins are sharp. Yeah. Uh, Any sort of glaucomatous scariness to the nerve, yeah. or just cup uh, cupping. So he's 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 got a big cup, but he's got a nice rim. Yeah, yeah. there's a nice. Yeah. For, yeah. Um, then maybe there's some macular dulling in the eye a little bit, but it's much more <laughs> prominent in the left eye. Yeah. yeah. Nerve looks pretty similar. 
Um, so we talked about, I was saying like something like Dell before, but like here in the left eye, we would yeah, say there's a- There's like a large hypopigmented- Right, lesion, lesion in the macula. macula. Yeah, yes. yeah. And we don't know in the right eye. Like something's not right, but we can't really tell. Yeah. Other than that, in the right eye, anything else that strikes you? Not really. Right, he has eyelashes. Left eye, let's go back to the left eye. So we feel like we have the same nerve in the left eye, same vessels. And then macula has a lesion in it. Uh, B2020. So, hmm. I don't know. It's good. And then super temporal, what's, what's, there's. Yes, it's like this kind of mottled pigment. Looking yeah. Yeah. Area. yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like fuzzy or sharp borders. So yeah. like maybe something. Okay. So. So I got, he has an OCT. Let me see if I can play it because I'm not good at this. There. So here's his OCT. Uh, John Bader. Let's play his OCT again. Oh, hold on. Most of the layers have good <clears throat> anatomy without any edema, but there is some. Elevation. Yeah, so there's something. I don't know if you saw this. So John Bader said there's choroidal elevation. Yeah, he's got a big bump in the choroid. Um, and there's something right over here. There's a little bit of like outer retinal attenuation, like something, something happened. Yes. And John Bader, let's look at this one. So left eye, and that's where we have the big hypopigmented lesion. Pretty pretty good, right? Other than yeah, there's oops. I can't stop on it. Yeah, so there's something something sort of RP thickening, no overlying fluid. Something he's something there. Um, so if we had to classify what kind of disease he has, anterior, intermediate, posterior, like as we're, we, we think, what do we think it is? Classifying it, like, what do we think he has? Posterior. Posterior uveitis, yeah. But he could have intermediate, we'll see. So this is FAF. So FAF is like helpful, right? So we have a guy that we saw has some kind of, there's definitely something very mild in the RPE in the right eye and definitely more you know, aggressive in the left eye or like more, uh, much area of like maybe subretinal fibrosis or thickening or RPE thickening. And so, you know, the, the FAF, which is like the place where the RPE tells you a story is telling you something, right? Okay. So I got an FA uh, and <laughs> so the right eye, so he's got that big hump, right? Um, and the right eye has, I'm just going to tell you, so this, the right eye, like, I, I, I don't know which eye I transited, but this is kind of like window defect because there's some RPE change. And so window defect is when you have like a transmission. So, so the, the RP is like gone there or changed. And so you might see some fluorescence sort of coming through. And then this thing just kind of stained, maybe pooled right in the center. Um, and this thing was also window defect. Um, so where do you think I'm going to find my hump, John Bader? So you said it's where? Right yeah, where's where's my hump? Uh, what what part of the eye? What part of the image is it in? It's not in the retina, right? Where is it? Oh. Yeah, it's in the cord. So I did uh, ICP. Okay. <laughs> so let me tell you that uh, I'm going to show you these pictures, and I'm going to tell you what the other person did, which makes sense. So I'm just going to tell you because ICG is a little hard. Um, so this person has this huge hy hypocyanescent lesion in the at the level of the choroid that you can't really see at the level of the uh, retina um, in the right eye. And as the study goes on, you can see it's persistent. Okay, so there's an area of like hypoperfusion there or space occupying like at the level of the choroid. And there's a few other ones here, one, two, three. And the left eye where we had sort of that area, I think it was over here, there was kind of that area that he had kind of this, RPE changes, sort of thickening fibrosis, but you can see that he has these one, two, three, four, 
but he has a bunch of little spots. This is pretty characteristic for a specific disease. Um, and so, but because of this, the, the, because, so the original person that saw this patient didn't get an ICG because like a lot of people don't have ICG, right? So she sent the person to Basil Williams at CEI, which makes sense because she saw a huge hump in the choroid. So what was she thinking about? No, no, no. Yeah, like a tumor. She, it's not like it's you know it's probably not a melanoma based on the features and how it looked on the imaging, right? Like you couldn't see it. It's not a a melanotic melanoma or melan. There's not a lot of melanocytes there. But she was like, okay, there's some. I, I there's a space occupying lesion. I'm concerned. I'm going to send it to Basil Williams just to be sure. So the patient didn't have an ICG and like, but if you got the ICG, you could see that he clearly has a bilateral disease. And you know, it's probably you know unless he has. Mets. So that was one thought that they had. Does he have Mets? None of this looks like what you would think of for a Met, but they said, you know, even on exam, it doesn't look quite like that, but they thought maybe it could be a Met. So they did a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, not the chest, and they found some weird like congenital renal vessel abnormality, but it wasn't clinically relevant. And after that and saying like, okay, we don't think he has cancer, um, this person said that she thought the patient had relentless placoid because of the left eye, I guess, because it was more of like a placoid lesion when it originally presented. Um, and so she put, she, the, the rheumatologist looked that up and said, oh, cyclosporin would be a good medicine for this. And they never got a CT of the chest. I got a CT of the chest. So this patient has choroidal, what Basil Williams decided are choroidal granulomas in both eyes. He's a young African-American male. Um, you can't put demographics on everybody, but I was like, I think he has sarcoid. <laughs> so cyclosporin would not have been my medicine of choice for sarcoid, but they all work. They all can work. Some diseases, they really don't work. And there's very specific guidelines, but there's a lot of lack of guidelines. So you just kind of, it's a little bit of trial and error, you know, and there's some medicines that are easier to get than others. Cyclosporin has a side effect uh, for OCAPs. What's the side effect for cyclosporin? Does anybody know? We talked about this last year. Tanya, do you remember? Yeah. Hemorrhagic cystitis is cyclophosphamide. That's an alkylator. So cyclosporin is a T-cell inhibitor. An annoying one. You have to be treated for this. It's not very bad. It's just annoying. Hypertension. So they get high blood pressure. So he had high blood pressure from the cyclosporin, but he was doing well on it. So they just left him and he's treated for it. Okay, so eight months later, I saw him. So he'd already been on cyclosporin for at least six months when I met him. And so back to John Bader. <laughs> okay, so here's your right eye. Something is missing, right? It's gone, right? Oh, yeah, the choroidal elevation. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> so he has a little bit of something like doing something weird over there, but he's not symptomatic. And I, I think it's just could be some cavitation, could be some true leakage. It didn't really act like leakage. So, all right. So this is his FAF. Do you remember his old FAF had a little bit more sort of like hyper autofluorescence in the right eye? That's completely gone. Okay, so there. So he's hyper autofluorescence originally and hyper autofluorescence here and going back. So it's a lot better, right? Even the stuff up top, I think it's just missing from the frame because I can't, don't, <laughs> I didn't expect that to get that. I don't know why, but. And this is his FA, so it's like pretty similar. Um, this is ICG. So like this ICG, can we agree that it's better? Like it's a lot better, right? This right eye. So, um, so this is my endpoint for treatment for this guy. I have two endpoints. One is the, the OCT, right? And one is the OCT and one is the ICG. If I didn't have ICG, I would use the OCT. But if I never paid attention to the OCT, other than saying like, is it wet or dry? You know, because being a, a being a retina specialist or being a specialist is just sometimes is more than just like, is it wet inject? 
right? Like a lot of people come out of residency, they're like, I did 500 injections. I could easily do medical retina in a practice. And yes, you can do medical retina in a practice if you paid attention and you know how to make decisions, but like your decisions can't only be if it's wet inject. So you can't just be like looking at OCT and say, all right, it's a, it's an OCT of the retina. No, it's like, it involves the quarry too. So you have to pay attention. Like, you know, why is the, uh, why is there sort of a change in the angle of how the OCT looks and what's going on in the quarry? I could have gotten EDI, which I didn't, but um, I thought this was a really interesting case. Okay. Case three. So this is 26 year old male presented to outside retina with blurry vision in the right eye. It's 2025 in the right eye. <coughs> He's a smoker, the bad boy. Um, okay. Um, Tanya, what's, what's going on in a single cut of an OCT? We have some disruption of I can't tell if that's fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where the where's the fluid? Is it intraretinal or subretinal or? Nah. Yeah, it kind of seems he's like a little bit of subretinal fluid, right? And he this yeah, you're right. Like this kind of doesn't look. This is not beautiful transmission, right? Like we're not getting a beautiful picture. So I don't know something blocking that. Like it's hard to know. So it's like is is there is is there some kind of leakage happening or something weird that's creating this not so nice picture? Is he a bad boy? Does he not stay still? And so our picture is kind of fuzzy. I don't know. Um, left eye. Looks pretty good, right? This is a single cut, but I'll tell you all the cuts look like this. Okay, so I got an FA because I don't know. I was like, he has subretinal fluid. Let's see what's going on. How's FA look, Tanya? Pretty normal. Pretty normal, yeah. So the beginning was normal. It started normal. There wasn't any blocking. There wasn't any of this, but this is the end. No late staining of the. Here's how I look at an FA, and you, you guys know this. No late staining of the disc, you know, no vascular leakage or vascular whatever, uh, no pedaloid leakage and like no abnormal fluorescence basically. So I got an ICG because I was like, <laughs> something is leaking. And I don't know if you could see it very well, but he's got like, it. it it's kind of like this very, like so there's distinct spots over here, but this whole area is just kind of not normal. Like there's this hypocyanescence here. And it doesn't, it doesn't completely persist through the end of the study, but it's still there. And then the left eye has stuff too. So he's only complaining about stuff in the right eye, but I've now discovered that this gentleman has a bilateral process. I didn't know he had. His exam was pretty unremarkable. I really couldn't see anything when I looked in his, at his fundus, okay? So additional inflow, all of his labs are negative. We got MRI of the orbits. Um, I can't remember why we did that. I think he might have had a little bit of disc edema. And then CT of the chest. So we did a CT of the chest and he had micro, and he got a CT of the chest, I believe. I don't know if I ordered it or someone else ordered it because he had some kind of weird cough and he's a smoker. And so they found micronodules and they said he had tree and bud micronodule. Like, like basically he got the CT of the chest at an outside person because he had had this cough. And then our people overread it in pulmonology and they were like, this is sarcoid. We don't even need to get a bronchoscopy. He is sarcoid, 100%. And I was like, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so, um, so he, I put him on uh, methotrexate. He did pretty well for a while. And then he came back to me like, m like a month ago with a swollen nerve. And so I just like literally on exam, like he had disc edema. And I was like, oh, so I called his rheumatologist, um, Dr. Landeski, and was like, can you please add Humira? Because I'm assuming, like, we think he has sarcoid. You know, sarcoid could cause anything in the eye. So I don't think the disc edema is like something, like it's not a red herring. It's as a case active disease. And so, you know, and I'm seeing him in, um, I see him a lot in London, uh, Somerset. But so like all these patients that I see in London or Somerset, I always bring them here if I think that they have like an indication for uh, imaging. Like I don't just follow them there. And some of them I still follow there. And then every other visit or every third visit, I tell them they have to come to UK and they're very amenable because they're doing so much better. So they're like, okay, fine, like I'll come. And so I'll follow them with um, imaging that I think is you know appropriate. And I think like 
you know, you have to decide like how you're going to do it or what's available to you or what's standard. Um, so case four, I have a 12 year old male with a history of pink eye times two months seen by an outside ophthalmologist on cyclogel BID and pred forte three times a day. So he's on pred forte three times a day and he is um, 20, 20 in each eye. So he's doing great, right? He's 20, 20. Okay. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's got three plus cell in his AC and one cell, one plus cell behind the lens. Okay. So, Cody. So he's got three plus cell in the AC. So how's he doing on his bread forte? Not very well. Okay. And do you think three times a day of bread forte is like a lot? That's not a lot at all. Well, it's not, I mean, it's not. It, it, so like, how is bread forte supposed to be dosed? Like technically, according to like the package insert or whatever. QID. QID, exactly. Four times a day. So like, I could bump him up to every two hours, right? But he's he's 12, right? So what's gonna happen to him if that's my primary method of treatment at a 12 year old? Steroid response. I have a steroid response, right? What's the other bad thing that can happen to a 12 year old if you put, keep him on steroids? So this has been going on for month, months, right? Two months. So somebody was treating him cataract or something cataract or something. There you go. <laughs> Don't say or something. You know the answer. You're you're a smart guy. You know the answer. Okay. So yes, cataract, glaucoma. He's 12. <laughs> like we want him to live and have a good life. We want him to be a fighter pilot. Um, so and he has one plus cell behind the lens. So uh I saw it and I was like, you know what? He's had this three plus cell, it's spillover, and it's old appearing cell. Is that what I said? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but that's very common, right? Like we say old appearing cell. Like I can't say something is old appearing cell or I can't say it's spillover unless I do the test. Um, and he's 12. So like I have to be very concerned about his well-being because if I'm not, like he might not do well and I might switch him to Durazol. What happens if I switch a child to Durazol? What's, what's the negative effects? John Franklin, do you love Durazol? Not really, only situation right i don't love durazol i love and hate it i feel like in children it makes me very nervous because the glaucoma pediatric glaucoma people that i talk to feel like the ciliary body could just collapse so every time i use durazol in a child like i think in the back of my mind like i i could be really like something really bad could happen like i could get them on durazol and i may never even if i taper them off they may have such a bad steroid response that it's not not resolved when we take them off of steroids so I'm, I'm always a little bit like remiss of when to use Durazol. I'm pretty quick to pull the trigger on immunomodulatory ther therapy in children, and I'll show you his pictures too. So um, one thing I could appreciate about this, um, so Clay, not fair to ask you. <laughs> okay, so uh, media is clear, right? Vessels, maybe a tad tortuous, I don't know, like a tad. This, this looked a little tortuous to me. Um, how's the disc? This disc, this disc, any difference between the two? I mean, the left one looks more hyperemic. Uh-huh. Well, what about the borders? Uh, I guess the border is less distinct. Yes, exactly. So I thought that this little guy had like a little bit of a hyperemic disc in the left eye and, and he had this one plus cell behind the lens, okay? So this is his FA. <laughs> So it's not normal, like, uh, but it's, it's hard to tell when it's not normal if you're only looking at one image. So I'll tell you that the the shading of the FA should be like the hypo, uh, the the normal like, um, so the the lack of hi hyperfluorescence that you see in the fovea here, that's what the FA should look like. So this is um, this is leaking everywhere. There's small vessel leakage everywhere, like all the way from his disc <laughs> to the periphery. And the only place that's spared is the fovea, which is good. So that tells me that he doesn't have petaloid leakage in the macula, right? So that's why he's 20-20, but he's got a pretty robust late staining of the disc and a lot of small vessel leakage. So I had, what did I do? Angela, what did I do? Give him more therapy. Oh, but what, in what form? Oral? Yeah. 
So I gave him oral steroids because I was just like, I, you know, like Durazol is the only thing I could do where I could give him an injection. He's a kid. They're steroid responders. If you go on strong stuff and ultimately like this has been going on for two months, he's, you know, he's small, his life is disrupted. He's coming to a lot of appointments. I think he needs immunomodulatory therapy, but I didn't start immunomodulatory therapy first. Okay. Because this is probably like an intermediate and anterior uveitis. Parents, like if he's 2020 and he can like do okay on oral steroids, sometimes there's a balance between, do I need to take the time to show the, do I need to take the time to like show the parents that he needs this? So we did a burst taper of prednisone. We did one milligram per kilogram and we lowered by five milligrams each week. And he recurred after three weeks. So again, like we, and we, we had him on drops too. We kept the Pred Forte on board and he recurred. So we said, okay, back to a burst taper of prednisone and we'll go on methotrexate with, I think it was uh, Patty Lou. So I don't know, like, I think there's something about when your whole retina is leaking that your eye is just angry. So if you remember, I said, gee, I think his vessels look tortuous up here, right? They were, you know, and like, you just, you could write it off and say like, oh no, like it's fine. Like he's okay. <laughs> but like, that's clearly different. So his eye was like really angry and like the sheen of everything is like gorgeous. And I'll tell you that his OCT was a lot thicker when we started to when we finished. So this is him after, I think we repeated at eight months and this is his FA. Like, this is just, I mean, to me, this is like so rewarding. <laughs> Like he looks great. Sorry, I'm patting myself on the back here. No, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's great to have an endpoint that you wouldn't otherwise look for and to know that you're, you know, like treating it adequately. And I think that's really important is like assessing it to its full extent. Because if, you know, if, if you don't know, then you can't like plan for other things. Did, did he appreciate a vision difference? I'm assuming he was more comfortable, but did he? Yeah, it was more about comfort for him. I think he, he's a good, That's exactly. Like he's a real sweet, conscientious, not wild kid, but he didn't notice it. But his parents noticed like he is different, you know, and he likes to, he's a avid, uh, I, I think it's some kind of sports ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's baseball. So, um. 29 year old male presents with a history of floaters. This is a crazy case. Like I, I saw this the other day and I was blown away by this case. Okay. So he's 21 and, and maybe I'll ask my fellows. See you. Okay. So 29 year old male presenting with a history of floaters and blurry vision times three years. So he's a veteran. He's awesome. He's like coming in. He's like, Oh, for the last three years, I have floaters significant worsening over the last two to three months. And he's 20, 30 with pinhole, no improvement. And his anterior segment exam is totally normal, but he has one plus cell in the anterior, anterior vitreous, just one plus, it's like not a lot. Okay. So this is his fundus photo. I'm not going to ask you this part because it's easier. Uh, can't ask the babies. Okay. Farmer. Your PGY two now, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're still in the PGY2. Okay. We won't ask PGY2. Um, Peter, what do you, so media, how's the media? So start with the right eye. Uh, I think the media is a little hazy. Okay. So it's clearly like um, this color. It's okay. okay. Yeah. And you've got the macula. It's, it's obscured by it. like, yeah. Okay, so going back to the media, I realized I didn't see this. So this is, yeah, there's like a, a chunky in the media, right? Yeah. Okay, so the star of the show here is like out of when we do our media, disc, macula, uh, periphery vessels, like what's the star of the show here? Uh, I think this is artifact. Okay, what's the other star of the show? <laughs> but you know, it's like, it's optos, it's hard. Vessel. Vessels, right. So what's wrong with his vessels? <laughs> Whitening along with this. Yeah. So you're so lucky if you have vessels like this because you're like, oh, I can stop here and I know this is bad. <laughs> so here, Perry, what, which, which vessel, venules or arteries? Uh, 
opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Yeah, patchy periphlebitis. What about the left eye? Uh, it's, it's even more pronounced. Yes. And this dusting this over yeah. here. So he was sent to me mostly because um, he was sent to me because of these. See these? Yes. They get lost in the shuffle with everything else going on. But he was sent to me because of these three little dots. He was seen by optometry at Lee's Town, and they took a fundus photo that just captured like the posterior pole and disc, and they were like, <laughs> "It's posterior uveitis." Okay. So yes, he has tons of uh, periphlebitis uh, disc. I, I can't tell about the disc margin there, but it's also like covered in gunk. Yeah. So I got a fluorescein. Oh, I got an FA. Uh, sorry, I got an OCT first because it's the easy thing to do. Um, okay, so like, what can I use this OCT for? Like, what 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 is it helpful to show me right here, Angela? Well, I would be looking for any type of like lesions or edema. Mm -hmm. So he had no lesions or edema that was frank on the OCT when I flipped through the cuts. Okay, so like I couldn't see anything, but I have thickness maps here, right? So what's it showing me? Right, so what's a normal thickness map look like? Like if you had to like compare it to a food with sprinkles on it that Homer Simpson loves, what, what does a normal thickness map look like? What does Homer Simpson eat? Donuts. donuts. He loves donuts. <laughs> so when you look at a thickness map and you look at the topography, yeah, donut. Real data. <laughs> Sorry, I do have real data two eighty, but <laughs> I would say it looks like a donut, like more green. Not those red patchy. Right. So but no, but it looks like a donut in terms of like the, right, Michelle? Like kind of like the center. The center is like a hole where you get the dip, and then it kind of goes like that. So it's like the center of a donut. I think of like when I look at an OCT, I expect to see like that ring, and then things thin out as you come away from the macula. So when I look at the topography, to me it almost looks like a donut. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else thinks like that. Maybe I'm hungry all the time, but <laughs> I think of like it looking like, so this looks like a really scary, like ghost donut <laughs> with like all these like little things coming off it. What about this, Angela? What does this show you? Looks like that's um, so more elevation. Right, and what's it, what's it over? So my, my, can you see what my, yeah, sitting on the arcade, right? So like if you run over the arcade normally, like maybe it's slightly thicker than, but like it shouldn't look like this. Like, so that this tells you that this, this is, and notice that these wispies are also on top of vessels. So this patient has like, I know I'm going to see something on the floor scene and it's going to look mildly hellacious. <laughs> so I got a floor scene <laughs> and it looks terrible. <laughs> I was actually shocked to see how bad this looked. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, this is terrible. Angela, vessels or arteries? Oh, actually, mellus. What is it? Arteries or venules? Yeah, do you think it's on the arteries or the venules? Yeah, and like, I don't see any plaques in the arteries. I don't see any like hyperpigmentation in the arteries. And the disc is so. Yeah, it's like hot, well, the infamous hot nerve or late seating of the disc. Yeah, so he looks really bad. Okay, but he ha he got sent to me for spots, right? And so I was like, and he did have spots. Like you could see them on exam. Were you there, Mellis? I think Haley was there. Okay, <laughs> so there's his ICG. Uh, Michelle. I know you're my colleague, but <laughs> John Franklin's my colleague too. But I, I love, I love pimping. I think it's the best way to like have. Uh... We definitely have a lot of. <laughs> there we go. That's the flow voids in a pinpoint area of hyperfluorescence on the inferior arcade on the left side. Yeah. So flow voids, like the famous term coined by, I don't know, Spade Serafinuzzi, one of them, <laughs> like for OCTA. Yeah, so hypocyanescent spots, it's still an ICG, but yes, like some kind of hypoperfusion in the <laughs> choroid or cap, yeah, choroid. And so what's this pattern look like? Leopard spots. What? Leopard spots. Leopard spots. When do we usually see leopard spots? What, what's the study that we typically see that on? 
um, F or fungicidal fluorescence. Fungicidal fluorescence, and sometimes on FA, usually we see leopard spots there. Um, so we've got millions of hypocyanescent spots, horribly leaky vessels, uh, and lots of floaters. What's the disease that I'm thinking of? I don't care how old he is. What is it? Birdshot. There you go. So I was worried about birdshot, but I was like, he's 29. 29 year olds aren't supposed to get birdshot. But of course, there's like all these papers about teenagers with birdshot, and this patient with birdshot, and that patient with birdshot. So I was like, okay, like I got to order a test. Like, what test did I order? What's the strongest HLA association in all of medicine? A29. A29. So I ordered an A29. Okay. So settle down. Settle down. So I. So I ordered A29. Another thought I had was, could this be sarcoid, right? He has like spots and he's got a lot of leakage, horrible periflobitis, looks like that classic sarcoid thing, tache de bougie, like candle stripping. So I was like, okay, maybe that's what's going on. Oh, hold on. Somebody send me a chat. Does this boy have underlying disease? He did not have underlying disease, Julia, the, the boy, um, the little boy. He didn't have any underlying disease. Yeah. I thought he might have TNU, but we tested him, nothing. Um, so this guy, yeah, so I, just to tell you like other things that it could be syphilis, you know, so like I ordered a bunch of other tests, but these are the main ones like that I cared about. So it's chest x-ray negative, lysozyme, ACE, fine. I mean, that's not the only way you diagnose sarcoid, but that's another debate for another time. Syphilis negative, but his HLA A29 is positive, which I was shocked. So he's not the youngest person to be, uh, to have birdshot, but it is really concerning. So we're going to have a chat. Uh, at his next visit about what we're going to do with him. Uh, final case. I just thought this was a cool one because it makes me really depressed. Uh, so I wanted to share share my misery with you. <laughs> this is a sad one. <laughs> Not sad, but like I, I feel like a failure. So he's, she's a 29-year-old female. She presented to me with a history of posterior uveitis where she had to take <laughs> prednisone. She comes to me and she feels like her disease is inactive. I really like pimping the, the back row there, I have to say. Lucy. There you are. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What'd you say? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. So, uh, so this is a lady. She, she comes to me like this, right? And she had history of something that she took prednisone for. And she told me it was called PIC, uh, punctate interphoritis. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Like, looks like PIC to me. I hate thick. Um, so she's got these mostly parts, hypo. Hypo autofluorescent. Yeah, mostly hypo autofluorescent. That's probably schmutz on the lens. <laughs> and maybe there's some hyper in there, but she's not active. She's like, I'm not active. This is her, um, you know, the, the main important cuts through the OCT. So she's got this fibrotic thing, but she's 2020. She's doing good. So she comes back to me in <laughs> um, like uh, March. So I saw her in January. She come back to me in March of 2021 uh, and she looks like this. So Paris, do you see <clears throat> anything here? Um, there are some hyperpigmented and also hypopigmented lesions scattered. It looks worse than that FAF looked like before. Right, so the, oh, oh so when I saw her originally, she just had this, hyper hyper and hypo pigmented like fibrosis and whatever and now she's got this and this and this and this and this and what what is this what does this look like does anyone know there's like a, a disease that affects like it's usually unilateral and <clears throat> causes like an enlarged blind spot and uh so I Okay, so I'm gonna get the FA and then I'll, I'll 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 tell you what I think it looks like. So, can you see those spots that we were talking about, Paris? Okay, what are they doing? They're staining or leaking. Yeah, they're staining. And what are they doing here? They're staining. Yeah. Okay, so do you guys know for OCAPS what the stain early, stain late pattern is for white dots? So block early stain late is ampy. Early and late is mutes. That's right. I don't know who said it. 
<laughs> so it's like she had mutes. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this lady has mutes on top of her pick. Uh, so one thing that we talked about with mutes is mutes likes to come with other white dots. Like it likes to just like impose itself. You could have had multifocal choroiditis at some point and then you're gonna have a mutes. Um, and the other thing is, um, this is a very high yield OCAP topic. So I put her on, oh, sorry. Okay. So I put her on, uh, I put her on some prednisone. And she got better. So Dr. Goldstein at uh, Northwestern presented like five cases of PIC plus, like patients with PIC who get this like superimposed mutes. I don't know what you do with them because she's allergic to Chimera, but so this is what she looked like uh, when she was active. Okay. Do you see the, the way that the, the, the borders of this lesion look, they're all like kind of fuzzy and the cap isn't smooth and something's going on there. And then here, after we treated it, she's got a lot more like smoothness and things are kind of calmed down and okay so this is what she looks like now okay well this is what she looked like at one point and then she she came into me like this so now what's going on here peter and this is not an artifact yeah <laughs> i mean like it's kind of gone to the other eye see what's yeah yeah she's hypopigment spot and what's this does anyone know we like to do them at the VA. We just put one in everyone. Ozerdex. Yeah, it's an old Ozerdex. So there we go. <laughs> okay, so this lady, like I put her on cell set. I put her on Humira because all my friends said Humira is so great for PIC because PIC doesn't have a lot of good data for what you treat it with. Because uh, PIC, you have to treat the CNVM that comes secondarily and you also have to treat the inflammation and the spots that are coming. Um, and, you know, we think maybe they're micro CNVM, but like they still come more and more if you don't treat the inflammation, like you're not going to just treat it with Avastin. So I put her on Humira and she immediately had like a rash at the site and she was itchy everywhere. So that was sucky. And so then I switched her to Cellcept and she did okay with that. Then she got lost to follow up for a while. And then she, oh, and I gave her like a burst tamer steroids and bridged her with Ozerdex and so on and so forth. So I'm probably going to give her, she loves traveling. She loves to travel and she's going to Europe in September. And I'm just like, you're getting bilateral Ozerdex on top of your Avastin to go. <laughs> I'm like, and then, and uh, because I'm really worried that she's going to end up like, you know, she's, she's now, she's like, I think she's 20, 25 or 20, 30 in this eye, but she's like, this is different now. So she just makes me nuts. Oh, and she developed like, a pick as she developed a muse activation in this eye. So she makes me sad. Anyways, um, uh, just some clinical pearls about imaging and uveitis. So OCT can be used to localize layers of the retina affected, but also to monitor thickness changes. Um, you won't, don't want to rely only on OCT as an endpoint for all intermediate posterior and pan uveitis. So you have to kind of decide like what other tests you're going to do and how they're going to help you. If you're very empiric and you're just going to put everybody on medicine, then it almost doesn't matter as much unless it's something insidious where it's something that you're not going to see. So if you start everybody on methotrexate from day one, then like you're doing better than if you did nothing or if you put everyone on prednisone, but you still need those kind of endpoints to decide like, am I doing good or not? <clears throat> um, use the imaging to guide the diagnosis. So deciding what part of the eye is involved um, and use the imaging to guide treatment and titrate to this endpoint. I found this really helpful since I started here. And I feel like you know, hopefully most of my patients are doing good. I think I have some patients that are just really hard for me to treat and I, I'm still struggling, but I think we're doing a good job. So thanks for listening. And I hope that we can give a talk on perioperative management of uh, uveitis and surgery when we have a resident to kind of uh, help us, you know, slog through some of the details. These are my references.